right, so um, I had some questions over the weekend about how to get the sources that are on the bibliographies that I give you if they're not like direct full text in Galileo or in JSTOR. So I wanted to go over with everybody quickly this morning uh, how to use Deposa again, right? Because that's how you can get virtually anything that you need uh, to finish your assignments. Um, so remember that you will find it in this box here, like this little sidebar on the library homepage, right? So you just click on Tapasa. And if you're at home, you may need to log into it using your regular GSW CanesNet credentials. Uh, but if you're here on campus, um, then it'll probably just log you in automatically. So it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And this is the page that the articles that you order will appear on, right? So you'll get links to a PDF of the article you request. Um, and they'll send you emails when the article has arrived, right? It usually takes about 24 hours for the article to get to you. Um, unless it's something kind of obscure that they have to dig around for in weird libraries. But that doesn't usually happen, and I try not to put stuff like that on the bibliographies that I give you. So if you've got something that you need, right, you just click on Create Request. And you can request an article, a book, or other. Usually other is going to be like a book chapter, right? And I'll show you how to deal with that in a second because that's going to be a kind of special case. The, you know, there, there are a couple of special things you have to do so that they don't send you the whole book. But can I see somebody's bibliography for a second? So Jamal, can I see? Uh, just take that back for a second. Thank you. OK. So say that I want this first article here on Louise Bennett, right? All the information that you need to get the article from Tapasa is here in the citation, right? So the journal title in this case is Global South. It was published in fall 2010. And then you now there's this, you know, how did you learn about this item? You, again, like you don't need to, like, they require this. They won't give you the thing you need without filling this out, but you don't actually need to fill it out honestly because it doesn't affect how it gets you, how it gets to you. So um, I don't know, let's say, um, by performing a divination on the liver of a three-legged goat. I just, I, 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 I like to make them think I'm nuts. Um, and let's see, volume, volume number is four, issue number is two, page numbers 124 to 135, title of article, culture and nationalism on the world stage, Louise Bennett's Auntie Rochi Say Stories. The author of the article is Opal Palmer Adisa. And then once I've got this filled out, you know, I can give them, you know, the date I need this by, right? So let's say I need this by May 7th. And then I can scroll all the way down and submit. If I actually wanted this, I would click the blue button to submit the request. And they'd post the PDF for me, right? And send me an email when that was done. Now, if you want a book chapter rather than a journal article, right? you click on Other. And let's just delete all this. Well, we'll leave that. So the title that they're going to want first is the title of the book, not the title of the chapter, right? Keep that in mind. 
So let's go with this, um, where the, I had something in a second, right? This Lee Irwin article, right? Two Jamaican women writers and the uses of Creole. So the book is called Commonwealth and American Women's Discourse. And the author in this case, like, because it's a collection of essays, should be the editor, right? So it says it's edited by A.L. McLeod. The publisher is Sterling. We don't have the place of publication. That's okay, we don't need it. 1996. Page numbers are 124 to 134. The title of the chapter is Two Jamaican Women Writers and the Uses of Creole. Author of the chapter, Lee Irwin. And now here's where the big difference comes in between requesting a journal article and return, uh, requesting a book chapter, right? A book chapter is gonna default to loan in this service type box, which means they'll send you the whole book unless you tell them not to, right? And not in PDF form, right? They'll send you the physical book that you'll have to go to the library and collect. It also takes longer for the physical book to get here than it does for a PDF to get to you, right? So what you wanna do is make sure that you click on this and click copy so that you just get the PDF of the chapter you need, right? And then submit request. And again, you should get your PDF within 24 hours, right? So does anybody have any questions about this? Remember too, that in addition to the bibliographies I gave you, you can mine the bibliographies in the works cited pages of the sources you already have, right? And you can do the same thing with those. And just enter the same information, and yeah, you'll get the you'll get the articles. Yeah, Jamal. Okay, so you know how we turn in our um, independent bibliographies already. What well, if we find another source that we want to use? Um, as long as you had enough sources for the original annotated bibliography, as long as you had five, you'll still get full credit for it. If you didn't have enough sources yet, I'll give you till uh, say because it takes about 24 hours for the Tapasa thing to work. Um, I'll give you till tomorrow to get a full annotated bibliography. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of, of extra time. But yeah, if, if you find other sources, um, but you've already got enough, run them by me first. But yeah, that's fine, that's, that's totally okay. Um, one point I do wanna make, um, I believe I, this is what I was telling you before class today, right? So the minimum number of sources is five. The maximum number is seven. Because this is, for a research paper, relatively short, and you don't want to overwhelm your own argument with sources, right? So five to seven is the sweet spot here. That's about appropriate for a 2,000, 3,000, 2,000 to 3,000 word research paper. Is that counting like other sources within this book? Uh, no, um, the sources in the textbook itself that you didn't have to go find don't count. Because remember, part of the point here of the assignment is to get you, uh, to teach you to learn to use the library resources and get you comfortable using them. Any other questions? Pretty easy, right? Okay. So let's get into our topic for today. So, uh, so this is our last week of new material, right? So today we're talking about uh, writers in British colonies and the relationship they have with the English language. Next time, Jamal and Serenity will be talking to us about immigrant writers while uh, working in Britain, right? So. I've given you up here the list of poems I want you to read for next time. Um, and 
before class started, I was playing um, songs that were composed and performed by British immigrant artists. Is there, any, is there anything on this list that looks strange to you in terms of British immigrant artists? Some of these might, even be, might, might be unfamiliar to you, right? So Corner Shop was a group that had a couple of hits in the 90s. Um, they, uh, they were uh, led by a, Pakist by a British Pakistani musician, um, and the other musicians uh, were white British. Um, MIA is the stage name of Maya Arupagasam, who is a Sri Lankan singer and rapper, a Sri Lankan British singer and rapper, uh, born in Sri Lanka, I believe, but raised in Britain. And Bat for Lashes is the stage name of a British Pakistani uh, performer by the name of Natasha Khan. And how many of you are familiar with Queen? Okay, it's kind of hard not to be, right? You know, there was the, the big Bohemian Rhapsody movie, uh, what, you know, what, two or three years ago, right? And, you know, Queen is, you know, kind of like permeates much of North American and British music culture, right? Um, but Freddie Mercury, their lead singer, was born Farouk Balsari. Um, and he was of, he came from um, originally an Indian minority community uh, called the Parsis. And Parsi simply means uh, Persian in Hindi. Um, but um, the Parsis are Indians of Iranian descent who uh, follow a religion called Zoroastrianism, which is the pre-Islamic religion of Iran, right? So that was you know, the, the official religion of the Persian Empire before um, the Persians were converted to Islam. So. <clears throat> He qualifies in terms of immigrant artists as well, right? So part of one of the things I was trying to demonstrate here is the ways in which um, immigrant artists adapt to British cultural forms, um, like rock, like rap, like electro pop, right? So where I want to start with the material today is with this quote that I put on the board, and I want you to just. Sit for a minute and ponder what you think this means. Right? The English language ceased to be the sole possession of the English some time ago. Just sit, think about this, think about what it means, and think about how it relates to past material in the course, particularly as relates to uh, Britain's relationships with its colonies.
You can also think about this in terms of questions that it raises for you. Outside the moment that it ceased being, or it ceased belonging only to the English when they imposed it on all its colonies. Okay, yeah, and I think that that's a thing that we need to consider here is that at least initially, its relationship with the British colonies is yeah that it is an imposed language, right? Yeah, good. Uh, does anybody remember? Um, a couple of weeks ago when we looked at that Minute on Indian Education by uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay and what Macaulay's arguments about um, education in India were based on. All right. What did Macaulay think all should be the language of instruction for British-run schools in India? All sciences and uh -huh. math, they thought it was superior to all other languages because of how much that English had the college. Yeah, he tried to make the argument, right, despite a, an admitted lack of knowledge of Indian languages or Indian culture, right, that <clears throat> there was more value to be found in an English language library than in all of the great books of India, right? Now remember, too, that in addition to a kind of cultural supremacist argument, Macaulay was also making an economic argument, right? That educating at the very least the elite classes in India in English would facilitate trade with other parts of the empire and thus create conditions for economic growth, right? And profits for the East India Company on whose board Macaulay sat, right? So there, it's a kind of two-pronged strategy here, right? The idea here was to both express cultural supremacy and to maintain economic dominance, right? Did it also make us like English women just as dominant that came from other languages too? Like, did it get different uh -huh. from other languages? Yeah, and I, and I don't think that's part of what Macaulay was thinking, but is that how, sort of how you're thinking about the question? Yeah, if we uh, think about uh, the Louise Bennett piece here, right? Um, which I don't want to go too deeply into because I know you two wanted to talk a little about it. 
uh, next time. So I want to you know, give you some space here. But uh, if we look on page um, 856, can I get uh, somebody to read the first couple of paragraphs uh, for us here, starting from uh, my Auntie Rochi say that it boil her temper and really becks her for true. I get that because this is in uh, Jamaican Patois, this is probably a little bit more intimidating uh, to most of you. Um, and it can be a little uncomfortable, I think, for somebody who doesn't come from that background to speak in the voice of a Jamaican woman. So, you know what, why don't I just read it and <clears throat> we'll, we'll deal with it that way, right? My Auntie Rochi say that it boil her temper and really becks her for true anytime she hear anybody a style we Jamaican dialect as corruption of the English language. For if that be the case, then them should have called English language corruption of Norman French and Latin and all them Tara language what them say that English is derived from. Who knew here the word? Derived. English is a derivation. But Jamaica dialect is corruption. What an unfairity. So... There are two things we hear going on that I want to uh, point to. First off is this idea of derivation, right? So what's the fact about English that Bennett is pointing out? Yeah, that English itself isn't pure, right? It comes from other languages. So, you know, you do have that Anglo-Saxon Germanic language as the base, right? But this is mixed with Norman French, Latin, and all kinds of other languages, right? So the modern form of English is arguably a corruption of older Anglo-Saxon, right? But it's treated as a derivation, right? The word derivation is used. Right, which is non-pejorative, right? We, we tend not to think of the word derivation negatively. <clears throat> so this is the way that we talk about English, right? And yet, the Jamaican dialect, which operates the same way, right? It's created from contact between the English language and other languages, right? In particular, you know, she mentions the African Twi language, or the language uh, primarily of the Ashanti people of West Africa. So these European languages mingling together, right? Oh, that's a derivation. But you add a West African language to that, and suddenly what you have is corruption not derivation. So she's arguing here that there's a double standard, right? But as long as the linguistic mix remains primarily European, it's a derivation. But we only use a negative word when we throw an African language into the mix. And indeed, a lot of what she's talking about here is taking possession of and changing the English language to suit her particular circumstances, right? But do you notice what else she's doing? Do you notice any points at which the language she's using kind of seems to change a little bit? Are there points at which she's not speaking in uh, Jamaican dialect? It's a little hard to spot here because they're small, right?
she quotes here corruption of the English language. And then she says, English is a derivation, right? But then goes back into Jamaican Patois, and she says, but Jamaica dialect is corruption. So what she's doing here and at various points throughout this essay is what's called code switching. Have we talked about code switching before in this class? Is this something that's come up? No? Okay, so does anybody know what this is? Yes. Okay, what is code switching, Jamal? Basically, you change how you do not or speak your own language. Yeah. That's exactly what code switching is, right? Yeah, you change the way you talk or the way you present yourself based on who you're dealing with, right? So what Bennett is doing here and at other places in this essay is demonstrating that she is able to operate in both registers, right? She's perfectly capable of speaking standard English, but in her everyday life, there's no reason for her to do so because Jamaican, di Jamaican dialect, Jamaican patois better suits her personal circumstances and is better adapted for the kinds of things that she wants to say, right? Um, you know, she points out towards the end of the essay, right, that there are things that make sense in Jamaican dialect that when you translate them into standard English, you know, the Queen's English with received pronunciation and all that, sound ridiculous, that don't make any sense, right? Translating, you know, one shift me got to the sole underwear garment I possess, and, you know, mama, mama, dem catch papa, as mother, mother, they apprehended father, right? These don't sound appropriate for the titles of uh, folk songs anymore, right? But I want to, like, say this is on me, like, I'm not being a girl, but, like, it kind of reminds me how Jar Jar speaks in, like, Star Wars. Uh huh. It's like normal for their language, but like you hear Jar Jar talking, you're like, what are you trying to say? Yeah, and I heard that the, when that movie came out, the Jar Jar character took a lot of criticism for a few reasons, right? One is that it was clearly like a clownish figure meant to appeal to children, and a lot of people who were obsessed with Star Wars didn't really get that Star Wars was actually kind of always a kid's movie anyway. Um, but I digress. Um, but the other thing that people took the Jar Jar character to task for was um, kind of insensitivity in the way he, um, <clears throat> like you had this um, character who spoke in a, with a clear Caribbean, uh, Caribbean intonation and in Caribbean dialect and was played solely as a kind of clown for laughs um, who only succeeds through bumbling. Right? I think you know he manages to you know win the battle at the end by tripping over something and you know igniting a bomb or something, right? So he only succeeds by accident. So yeah, the fact that the character who spoke in Caribbean dialect was meant to be ridiculous, um, <clears throat> I think rightly um, upset a lot of people. But yeah, I, th I think yeah yeah. You, um, you, you, I think you are right to point out the, like the relationship here to the Jar Jar figure because I think that's exactly the kind of thing that Bennett is trying to push back against, right? Now, she, you know, this was you know, published in 1993. It was first broadcast on the radio in 1979, right? Um, but she's dealing with a longstanding cultural issue here of people tending to see dialect speakers as less intelligent or less cultured or less civilized simply because they don't speak with, you know, received pronunciation, right? They don't speak uh, quote unquote standard English, right? So <clears throat> one thing to point out about Bennett as well is that Bennett was, Brit was actually British educated. Um, these radio talks uh, that she gave, things like um, Jamaica language, were given in character. 
right? She developed this Auntie Lou character uh, who was this kind of folksy, uh, you know, folksy middle-aged Jamaican woman who became a popular television and radio figure um, in Jamaica. But she, yeah, she was educated at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in Britain, right? So, <clears throat> In a lot of it, like Bennett knows what she's doing in terms of self-presentation here, right? None of this is accidental. Now, let's try to take it back to, so let's try to take this back then to this first line we quoted. Now this comes from the end of the Salman Rushdie essay that I had you read um, about English as, a, as an Indian literary language. But let's think about the ways in which what we just said about Bennett relates back to this statement directly. How is Bennett, how are Bennett and other Caribbean writers um, and performers taking possession here of the English language? Publishing in their own better work. Yeah. They're publishing and performing in their own form of English, right? And they're arguing for the, the artistic and cultural validity of other Englishes, right? Of non-British Englishes. So they're taking what was originally an imposed language, right? And they're remixing and reformulating to better suit their particular cultural circumstances. Now let's relate this uh, to Kamal Braithwaite's uh, essay on nation language as well. And Braithwaite makes the familiar point about education on page 863, right? Something we've already discussed. Can I get somebody to read on page 863 from In the Caribbean as in South Africa? In the, in the Caribbean as in South Africa, the educational system did not recognize the presence of these various languages. Mm -hmm. What our educational system did was to recognize and maintain the languages of the conquistador the language of the planter, the language of the official, the language of the Anglican preacher. It insisted that not only would English be spoken in Anglophone Caribbean, but that the educational system would carry the contours of an English heritage. Hence, as Dennis said, Shakespeare, George Eliot, Jane Austen, British literature and literary forms, the models that were intimate to Great Britain that had very little to do really with the environment and the reality of the Caribbean were dominant in the Caribbean educational system. Mm -hmm. People were forced to learn things that had no relevance to themselves. Paradoxically, in the Caribbean, as in other, as in many other cultural disaster areas, the people educated in this system came to know more to, even today about English kings and queens than they do about their about our own national heroes, our own slave rebels, the people who helped to build and to destroy our society. We are more excited by English literary models, by the concept of, say, Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood, than we are by Nanny of the Maroons. A name some of us didn't even know until a few years ago and in terms of what we write, our perceptual models, we are more conscious of the falling of snow, for instance. The models are all there for the falling of the snow than of the force of the hurricanes that, they, that take place every year. In other words, we haven't got the syllables, the syllabic intelligence to describe the hurricane which is our own experience, whereas we can describe the important alien experience of the snowfall. It is the, that kind of situation that we are in. Okay, so 
a lot of what Braithwaite is talking about here, thank you, Nick, um, is um, how education in English language and literature has shaped Caribbean art, right? That's one of the big arguments of his essay, right? So what are the models he claims most Caribbean poetry uh, is based on? Yeah, okay, so the stories about Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood, right, rather than, um, you know, <clears throat> Native Caribbean heroes like Nanny of the Maroons, right? So, yeah, so. The heroes and cultural reference points. And in addition to that, even the literary forms, that like he talks about the syllabic intelligence. Of Caribbean poets is shaped by British models, right? And here he talks about um, two different weather patterns, right? One of which is relevant to Britain, one of which is relevant to the Caribbean, right? So which, what kind of weather pattern is actually relevant to Caribbean experience? Hurricanes. Yeah, hurricanes, right? For two reasons. Right, one, hurricanes are fairly common in the West Indies, right? And hurricanes also tend to do a ton of damage especially in high poverty communities, right? There's flooding, they knock buildings down, um, right? They're a destructive uh, force, much like the imposition of English language and British cultural models has been a destructive force, Braithwaite seems to be arguing, to the development of Caribbean poetry, right? So what's the what's the experience that he that what's the weather pattern the experience that is not relevant to Caribbean uh, life that they talk about in school? Snow. Snow. Yeah, everything's about snowfall, right? Right. The snow was falling on the corn in Shropshire, right? Now. <clears throat> You know, uh, Braithwaite's from Barbados, right? You know, no one in Barbados ever sees snowfall if they stay in Barbados, right? Um, so the more relevant experience for him would be rain was falling on the cane fields. But that's something that they don't have students write in their little English exercise books in Caribbean schools because the model that they're being taught is a British model, right? And it's not just about teaching English language and teaching within a British system. It's also teaching British supremacy, right? That British models are more important. Yeah, go ahead, Hannah. Um, when I'm talking about like, the cornered people who inhabited such a landscape, I guess I'm talking about like, the English people who inhabited such a landscape. Mm -hmm. And then I guess um, well, I think yeah, he, he's not talking about people living in the Caribbean. He's talking about like, when he says like the snow was falling on the fields of Shropshire, which is what our children were literally writing until a few years ago, before below drawings they made of white snow fields and the corn-haired people who inhabited such a landscape. He's talking about the people who would live in a place like Shropshire, right, which is a county in England. Um, but yeah, I think there is also that kind of that reference, like in the discussion both of corn and of corn-haired people. Right to the lack of relevance to a Caribbean context and to um, yeah the language and culture of the invaders yeah so I want to connect this as well since we're talking about language and educational systems kind of shaping 
cultural self-perception here, right? Let's kind of shift quickly here to the Gugi Watongo um, essay. Um, one thing to quickly note about this as well, um, usually like which, when you're talking about an author, which of their names do you usually use to refer to them, the first or the last? You usually use the last name, right? In Gugi's case, we use the first name because um, in Gakuyu, the family name comes first, right? So Gugi is his family name, Watongo is his uh, personal name. And <clears throat> let's look quickly at the way he describes his education in English schools. Like for one thing, what is the most important subject in school? English. Yeah. What happens to students in this Kenyan educational system if they don't do well in English? no matter how well they do in anything else. Okay. Yeah. He talks about his classmate, right, the most brilliant boy in his class, who got distinctions in every subject but failed English, and thus was made to fail the entire set of exams, right? And exams are required in this system to move on to the next level of schooling, right? If you don't pass your exam, uh, you know, I think there are, I forget which comes first, but there are what are called A levels and O levels. In the British system. And moving on first to high school and then to university is dependent on scores on these exams. So <clears throat> what happens to this poor kid is that he does great on all of his exams, messes up one, but messes up the wrong one, right? And then how is Googie's situation different from this kid? He doesn't do Yeah, he does just okay in everything else. But because he gets a distinction in English, right? That means he's able to move on to the elite high school and then to move on to the university, right? So facility in English language under British colonial rule was the only way as part of the indigenous population that you actually moved up, right? If you didn't learn English or you didn't learn English well, you didn't move along in that society, right? And so what we see here, like what we see Googie doing in this essay is relating English to competition, right? Because there are only so many spots in these elite schools. And so only so many students are gonna get to go on to them. Now, what else happens in the English language schools that's related to these distinctions between um, home languages and English? What happens in his school to anybody who's caught speaking is caught speaking to Kuyu? Corporal punishment. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting to if we look for a minute at how they find the perpetrators, or like how they catch the kids who've been speaking Kikuyu. Can I get somebody to uh, start reading on the bottom of page 869 from thus one of the most humiliating experiences was to be caught speaking Kikuyu? Thus one of the most humiliating experiences was to be caught speaking Kikuyu. Uh, Kikuyu. Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. And the tendency of the school. The co-perpetrator 
Yeah. Bless you. Corporal punishment, three to five strokes of the cane on the bare of buttocks, or was made to carry a metal plate around the neck with an inscription such as, I am stupid or I am a donkey. Sometimes the culprits were buying money they could hardly afford. And how did the teachers catch the culprits? A button was initially given to one pu uh, pupil. pupil who was supposed to hand it over to whoever was caught speaking his mother tongue. Whoever had the button at the end of the day would sing who had given it to him, and the ensuring process would bring out all the culprits of the day. Thus, children were turned into witch hunters, and in the process were being taught the lucrative value of being a traitor to one's immediate community. Okay, thank you. So, what are they being encouraged to do? What are the children being encouraged to do here? Yeah, they're being encouraged to not, right? They're being encouraged to rat each other out, right? Ferret out all of the kids who are speaking Kikuyu, right? If you catch somebody, you get special privileges, right? Did they say that they were warned with like presents and stuff? Yeah, like the, the kids who do well in English get you know, you know awards, prizes, academic distinctions, right? And the biggest distinction they get is social mobility, right? They're the ones who get to move on to the elite schools. Though you know there are um, still, I mean, you know, this is something that Googie talks about elsewhere in his work. Like they, there are serious glass ceilings here, right? Um, that. A native Kenyan only goes so far in this system, and this is kind of one of the things that ends up frustrating him. So, you know, one of the ways we might think about this is, you know, like imagine, you know, that you know Canada invades the United States, right? And you know, they win, they take everything over, and suddenly, like everything is defined in terms of Canadian cultural preferences, right? All the like slab bacon like you're used to gets replaced by these little like kind of round pieces of ham like things. Krispy Kremes get replaced by Tim Hortons. What? Tim Hortons is the Canadian donut chain. Yep, no more Krispy Kremes, only Tim Hortons when Canada takes over. People expect you to put maple syrup on everything, right? And everybody has to smile and be polite and wear sweaters. Right? This sounds ridiculous, right? But this is the kind of thing that's happening in these colonized societies, right? And the other more insidious thing, apart from this, you know, dissemination of an alien set of cultural preferences, is that one, how far you go is dictated by how well you assimilate to those particular cultural practices, right? And that however far you make it, all of the top positions will always be occupied by people from the colonizing culture, right? No matter what you do, however well assimilated you are. And so this is why we see, like, like even you know, in countries that were decolonized in the 40s through the 1960s, right, which is you know, kind of when the, the British Empire really falls apart after World War II, most of um, the governments in these countries are modeled on the British Parliament. Um, their cultural institutions, you know, their, their you know, public Radio and television services are modeled on the BBC. Um, and their educational systems largely still follow these imposed British models, right? It's very hard to break these habits. And indeed, um, you know, even a lot of cultural elites in these countries still send their children to be educated in Britain rather than having them educated in the home country. So the other thing I want to point to in um, the Googie essay here is what sorts of things he associates 
with his native language of Gikuyu. So can I get somebody uh, to start reading uh, at the beginning of this from I was born into a large peasant family. I was born into a large peasant family. Father, four wives, about 28 children. I also belong as well as we all did in those days to a wider extended family and to the community as a whole. We spoke Gikuyu. Gikuyu. Mm -hmm. As we worked in the fields, we spoke Gikuyu and, and outside the home. I can vividly recall those evenings of storytelling around the fireside. It was mostly the grown-ups telling the children, but everybody was interested and involved. We children could not retell the stories the following day to the other children who worked in the fields picking the pyrethrum, pyrethrum. pyrethrum flowers, mm -hmm. tea leaves, or coffee beans from our European and African landlords. The stories most of with mostly animals as the main characters, were all told in Gigeku. Hair, being small, weak but full of innovative wit and cunning, cunning was our hero. We identified with him as he struggled against the brutes of prey like lion, leopard, hyena. His victories were our victories, and we learned that the apparently uh, weak can outwit the strong. We followed the animals and their struggle against the hostile nature, drought, rain, sun, and wind. A confrontation often forcing them to search for forms of cooperation. But we were interested in their struggles amongst themselves, and particularly between the beast and the victims of prey. These twin struggle, struggles against nature and other animals reflected real life struggles in the human world. Yeah. One more paragraph. Not that we were ne neglected stories with human beings as the main characters. There were two types of characters in such human-centered narratives. A species of truly human beings with qualified of courage, kindness, mercy, hatred, and evil, concerns for the other, and man eat man, two mouth species with qualified of greed, selfishness, individualism, and hatred of what was good for the larger cooperative community. Cooperative as the ultimate good in a community was the constant theme. It could unite human beings with animals against oars and beasts of prey. As in the story of how Dove, after being fed with castor oil seeds, was sent to fetch with Smith working far away from home and whose pregnant wife was being threatened by these man-eating two mouth wars. Okay, so what are the values here that he associates with his home language of Gikuyu? Remember that like he, he's associated English with competition and with snitching, right? right. What's that? Okay, with, with, with morals and like more specifically, like what kinds of morals? Okay, courage. Yeah, the power of the small and the weak. Okay, good. And is there another word that keeps cooperation? Yeah, cooperation. Good, yes. Gakuyu, he associates with cooperation and with the community working together, right? And I think this is also part of the reason why he mentions uh, his family background here. I was born into a large peasant family, father, four wives, and about 28 children. Right? <clears throat> the, he's pointing out that in his, you know, in his native culture, right, the family structure is different. It's not a nuclear family with, you know, a you know, husband, wife, and 2.5 kids. It's, you know, one father, multiple wives, and several children, right? So the family structure is also more like a community than it is kind of like a little individual island um, sitting in its house in a suburban subdivision, right? 
So everything about his home culture, he seems to associate with community and with cooperation, right? And English ends up being a kind of betrayal of these ideas of community, or requires betrayal of these ideas of community. So there are basically two strategies that a writer working in an imposed colonial language can choose to take. The first is called abrogation. And abrogation is total rejection. of the dominant dialect. Right? Not rejection of the language itself altogether, right? But rejection of the colonists' version of it. And a writer who abrogates the colonial language will write in their own native dialect, which means that it will often be difficult, but not impossible, for readers who speak the, the dominant dialect to understand. Yes? What was the difference between dialect and the nation language? Yeah, uh, Braithwaite doesn't like the term dialect because he thinks it... Um, Wasn't that like it's offensive? Yeah, he, 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 he finds it... Um, that a dialect is like a, a, a lesser form of a language, right? That a dialect is like a kind of alternate version, whereas nation language he thinks describes a kind of more, um, a more organic development. I'm using the word dialect here in part because frankly, I just don't really know a better word for what I'm trying to say. Um, I would like to be using a better word for it, um, but I'm not, um, I'm not yet fluent enough in general linguistics uh, to have a better word um, that speaks of, to this kind of language generally, right? Um, you know, I can talk about Jamaican patois. I can talk about, you know, Creole. Is, you know, let's actually, let's go with writes in, writes in a Creole rather than a, a Creole is more or less the same thing. Isn't Creole like uh, French is a form of Creole, uh, but the, uh, the process of Creolization is this kind of linguistic mixing that um, Louise Bennett is talking about. But no, yeah, yeah, you, you, are, you are right to point that out, um, that I should not, uh, that I should avoid using the term dialect. Now, most of the three writers we've been talking about here primarily follow this strategy primarily, right? Or argue for this strategy primarily. Now, the author who we cited at the beginning of class here, Salman Rushdie, follows another strategy that's referred to as adaptation, right? We don't really have time to get too deeply into uh, Rushdie's essay here, or his major points, but a writer who does this, a writer who um, takes the uh, dominant dialect and adapts it to his or her own particular cultural circumstances um, is engaging in this, right? Writes in the dominant, yeah, dominant form of language. but often with a specialized vocabulary and attention to 
native cultural forms. So um, Rushdie, for example, writes in what is sometimes called the Chutnified English. He, he writes in standard English, but he uses a lot of, uh, he uses a lot of words from Hindi and Urdu in his writing. Um, and he often writes sentences in a way that mimic the particular speech patterns of <clears throat> Hindi and Urdu speakers who are speaking English. Right? So, uh, so Indians uh, who speak English. All right, so we're about out of time here. I will email you uh, the guide questions because I forgot to put them on my stupid little thumb drive. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, so uh, next time we will have our last presentation. Uh, Sarmi and Jamal will tell us about the Windrush generation and its impacts on British poetry. And uh, yeah, and then um, our last class session a week from today, we'll just be reviewing for the final, right? <laughs>